Good morning and good afternoon. I am Dario Conci. Welcome to the webinar, Start and Grow Your Fashion, Retail and an F&B Business in Hong Kong and Macau, which has been organized by Invest Hong Kong, the UK DIT, uh, Jack Lawyers from Macau and Oxford. Over to you, Corin. Thanks very much, Dario, and uh, a very warm welcome from Hong Kong. Um, as Dario mentioned, my name's Karen Wilson, and I'm the Director of Trade and Investment for the Department for International Trade here in Hong Kong, uh, working with my colleague Arthur Yu, uh, who we'll be hearing from shortly. Um, I would just like to say a, a couple of quick, quick thoughts from, from me on, on doing business here in and with Hong Kong. Um, UK government is very committed to doing business here. Uh, we have a strong priority on fashion, consumer and retail. Um, and at the highest level of UK government, we're very committed to doing business with and in Hong Kong. Um, three of the key areas we're working on uh, in the near future, uh, certainly post-Brexit, focusing on all things global Britain, so supporting UK companies doing business in here. Uh, and not only Hong Kong, but all around the world. Um, obviously, we're, we're keen to uh, see the back of the wonder that is COVID, um, and hopefully that will uh, be happening in early next year, but uh, who knows with the wonder that is COVID, but we are committed to supporting UK companies uh, get past that. And one big uh, campaign for us and the UK and the UK government and the world in, in 2021 is COP26 with the focus on sustainability, which cuts across all industries and sectors, uh, including fashion, including retail, and will be committed to supporting uh, all companies operating in these areas. So you'll hear much more from my colleague, Arthur Yu, uh, later on in the webinar. Um, but I'd just like to say one big thank you to, to Hawksford uh, for organizing this and for, for colleagues from Invest Hong Kong and JAC Lawyers. Uh, who you'll also be hearing from later in the webinar. So enjoy the webinar and do save up any questions for myself and my colleague for, for later in the in the webinar. So uh, on that point, I will hand back to Hawksford. Thank you, Corin. So today's agenda uh, will start with Andrew Davis, uh, Head of Investment Promotion uh, for Invest Hong Kong, based in London, whereby he will be talking about the Hong Kong and Macau economic outlook. He will be followed by Arthur Yu, as Corin mentioned, who is the head of consumer and retail for the DIT uh, in Hong Kong, and he will set out consumer trends for F&B and fashion retail. We, as Hoxford, will be instead discussing about company setup, tax and accounting requirements in Hong Kong in the event you decide to start activities, uh, retail activities in Hong Kong. And we will finish off with uh, Joanna Alves Cardoso, partner of Jack Lawyers, uh, who will be discussing about starting a company and a direct retail activity in Macau. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name's Andrew Davis. I uh, represent Invest Hong Kong here in the UK, and uh, I've been with Invest Hong Kong for 10 years, both in Hong Kong and now in the UK. And so what I'd like to talk to you this morning about is um, uh, the environment in Hong Kong for uh, people in um, retail, fashion, hospitality businesses, uh, and also how Invest Hong Kong can help them. So Invest Hong Kong is part of the Hong Kong government and is there to provide a free and confidential service to companies. And we have both a consumer products team in Hong Kong, as well as a tourism and hospitality team. Uh, here in the UK, we have a team also helping UK companies make those first steps to Hong Kong. So can I have the next slide, please? I'll be very brief in this. You know, Hong Kong, one of the reasons business is set up there, you know, ignoring the fact that you've got a, a market of 7 million people and access to half the world's population within a five hour flight, it has a very competitive and simple tax system. So the first 200,000 pounds of uh, profit is only taxed at 8.25%. And it's the fact that there are very few other taxes. There's no VAT, there's no capital gains tax, there's no 
tax on beer or wine. So a very important point when you think about competing locations in Asia, why Hong Kong is the place to come. Next slide, please. Also, it's not just about Hong Kong. The very sophisticated connections now to the Greater Bay Area. Um, these cities, as well as Macau, in the Greater Bay Area are now really very close by road, rail, sea, and air. So it's a huge population to be attracted to your business, your products, your brand. Next slide, please. And of course, Hong Kong, with its free flow of information, with all the Western uh, social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, linking very closely into all the mainland Chinese ones, um, you know, WeChat, Weibo, etc. So it's a great crossing point for spreading the word on brand and a product. Next slide. Some examples. This is uh, one of our Japanese um, multi-brand retailers who's recently come. They've opened three stores in um, Hong Kong with an unusual 20-hour, 24-hour format. They're large and they cover a wide range of product lines from Japan. Hong Kong does love Japanese products, Japanese brands, Japanese design and culture. So they've done extremely well in coming into Hong Kong. Um, next slide, please. On the other end of the scale, more recently we've had Fortnum and Mason established. You know, this is a very old British band, uh, grocers to the royal family, and they have opened a stunning location in K11 Museum on the Kowloon side. And this includes both retail and hospitality, a, an outstanding view over the harbor. And it's their flagship store for Asia. And you know, I think you know, if anyone goes there, they really see how um, what is a niche brand can do really well with that very, very high-end experience. And so, as the slide says, both online and offline experience through their store in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. Another one which comes from my um, colleagues in the Netherlands, um, in Brussels rather, and it's a Dutch company, but one that was actually founded in the UK. Um, it's um, a B2B marketplace for diamonds and jewelry. And interestingly, they've seen their business grow during COVID-19 times. And being in Hong Kong, it was about being close to key clients, their regional APAC office, and really expanding now um, their business as there's such a good demand for diamonds in Asia. Next slide, please. And in this, I'm coming on to discussions about, um, next slide, is some new trends and, well, not new trends, trends that are taking off at this particular time. Pop-up stores have become very, very popular for brands to look at entering the Asian market through Hong Kong. And, you know, we've seen, you know, everything from flip-flops in, the Haviana store through to ones who've done it in the past and now have physical stores, people like Eagle, um, Museum Context, etc. have all done this through pop-up stores, but because of the uncertainty that COVID has brought, pop-up stores have become a very popular way of entering the market. Next slide, please. Also, there are trends, you know, uh, I think this may be something that's not limited to just Hong Kong, but wellness, staycations, home spas, home cooking, all these sort of things. Uh, in a conversation yesterday with a British um, uh, food uh, restaurant brand, 
in London, they are they are experimenting with basically all the raw ingredients in a box being delivered to your home from a high-end restaurant so that you can do if you don't want to go out, you can do their food in your own home. And I think staycations has been a big boom in Hong Kong recently with hotels offering all sorts of packages, whether it's dining in, spas, all sorts of uh, experiences to go with staying in a hotel. So these are new things that Hong Kong is offering. Next slide, please. As well, um, the need for a greener, cleaner world has meant that uh, sustainability is becoming forefront. Um, we're seeing now with one of our clients from the UK uh, who are offering uh, coffee in biodegradable um, capsules. So capsule coffee is no longer that aluminium waste that just goes into landfill. It's biodegradable. And so you're seeing this naked shopping, which doesn't mean the shopper is naked but the food is naked, it doesn't come run wrapped in plastic. So all of this um, is coming in as new trends and means that businesses from UK and Europe can find new opportunities in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. UK, of course, um, has done extremely well in Hong Kong. In the last three years, we've helped over 115 UK companies big and small set up there. There are large numbers of UK companies who are based there. Um, some doing um, engineering, some in F&B, a lot in retail. And a lot of these have connections across sectors. So the engineering company are actually supplying product that goes into the food and drink industry. So a lot of interesting um, companies coming in. And of course, it's access to the wider Asian market as well as mainland China. Of course, yeah, the other, the Y Hong Kong, historic links, strategic location, English language and the talent pool, all vital components to why it makes such an easy touchdown point for British companies. And I have to say that from Invest Hong Kong perspective, the UK, office is the busiest single office globally for Invest Hong Kong because so many UK companies find success in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. So if anyone uh, wants to reach out, here are my contact details. Um, we're there on Twitter, LinkedIn, Invest Hong Kong are there on YouTube and Flickr. So we're very easily accessible. Please reach out, myself and my colleagues, both in Hong Kong and in the UK, will be happy to hear from you. So thanks very much, Dario, over to you. Okay, so um, a big welcome everyone. Um, good morning to you for all those who are dialing in from the UK. So I'm Arthur from the UK Department for International Trade, working with Corin. I head up the a consumer and retail team that uh, we help UK businesses to export to Hong Kong and the team also cover Macau market as well. Today, I'm joined by our Director of Trade and Investment, Corin, who is the best person to answer big questions, so Brexit, UK, Hong Kong, trade relations, you name it. Feel free to drop any question at the chat box and we will pick up either immediately or at a later Q&A session. So, um, next slide, please. So, this is an introduction of the DIT team. Next slide. So, uh, to begin with, I want to talk about the COVID situation in Hong Kong. So we saw a spike of outbreak in August, a number of breaking measures has put in place. And I will later show how it shapes consumer behavior temporarily and for the long run. So first of all, we saw the, fir the forced closure of business premises. So you see beauty parlor, gaming center, party rooms, 
and also 16 kind of premises was being uh, under forced closure. But now the restriction has already been greatly relaxed since the infection number has already remained at a very low level. Um, but you can imagine that business now are desperate for immediate cash flow and I will explain how it affects um, the, the kind of uh, promotion and marketing strategy that they are now using. Um, and also the, um, the business hours has been shortened for restaurants so it's it used to start at uh, the restaurants should start end at six o'clock and then gradually a relaxation of that law being um, they should uh, shut at 10 and now 12 o'clock and we still observe a mass gathering ban so now we cannot have a gathering for more than four people of course there are uh, exceptions for example for wedding for uh or for like um guide guided tours and i would like to also mention this because um I think Hong Kong has uh, implemented, is one of the few markets that have implemented a citywide COVID testing. So around 1.7 million population has joined that program. Um, it has identified around 30 infections and the purpose is to detect hidden spreader and to create a citywide COVID free bubble. So suffice to say that um, we are we have um, up our game and being very um, taking all the precaution in prevention of another outbreak. So on that, whether will there be another um, uh, wave of COVID outbreak? I think uh, at least we, we are suffice to say that we are well well prepared for it and have all the measure in place to control it at the lowest level. And um, also to mention border remain shut. So. Um, to cross-border tourism will remain very quiet and um, and as you can see we are all working from office instead of home so um, it actually uh, we all resume normal working patterns starting from mid-September so this is how the the market has been looking like how the consumer behavior that are gradually moving from home to streets but worth noting that there are still retain some resilience in order to enable organization to um, to 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 actually um, allow their staff to work from home again if necessary. So um, I will talk about now the the first trend. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the Green Egg Island, one of the many ordinary outer island in Saigon District. The place was populated with locals after a natural scene there was appraised by a TV show. To highlight the effort required to get there, the place is only accessible by kayaking or walking through the woods. For everyone, reference kayak and stand up, board, stand up paddling boards are all booked till mid October since October or since August. So apparently, it makes good business for sports equipment. But the trend shows something more than that. If you take Green Egg Island as a product, it is not the usual success we, use, we often see in the market. The place is hard to find, hard to reach, not exactly about the chill vibe and relaxation. The backbone of its success is the unique experience it offers to its consumer. Kayaking, a bit diving at the clear water, prepare your own food and probably the, uh, the vanity of posting the photos on Instagram. So you see, taking this internet sensation as an example, COVID see the end of pure consumer who wants only the enjoyment of the end product. They are no longer the recipient of your brand messaging, but also a co-creator. So as, um, as Andrew just uh, mentioned that you will have restaurants and hotels actually sending the ingredients to uh, your client's home. And we also in Hong Kong see the, the trend of self-made cocktail, for example, to really have a ready-made package so that the, um, the consumer can also enjoy the creation of the end product. So it is something for the brands to think about how to involve your consumer into, into your product and into your marketing strategy and something more durable engagement on social media 
and that is also um, getting um, something that uh, brands should place more focus on. And the next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? So it sounds a bit contradicting to the last slide when I talk about going out nature, and now the next trend I'm going to talk about is staycation. So you see from, from the picture, like you can imagine that the occupancy rate of hotels are actually not that low compared to when COVID started at, in Hong Kong. Um, the reason is, imagine you are going out with your friends. Cinema, beauty parlors, bars, game centers are all in forced closure. Where can you go? So staycation become a very obvious answer to them. So this is the facade of a hotel in Chim Sa Choi. And I think it speaks for itself about how Hong Kong people are crazy about staycation. This is a perfect example of how merchants reorganize their business resources into becoming more domestic facing. A standard staycation package often bundles with a dining voucher, free meals, and one night stay with late checkout arrangements. On top of these, some will even provide champagne, free uh, switch PlayStation rental room decorations. So the balloons are actually, the balloons decoration are actually arranged by the hotel. And Netflix, projector screens, exam, for example, uh, et cetera. And some hotels even come up with that uh, work from hotel scheme. And um, it is something quite similar, so I don't look into details of this. A competitive price is absolutely a drive. People can finally enjoy risk Carlton for season at a very price-friendly rate. But it is also about an escape from family, whom have been staring at each other 24-7 since the beginning of 2020. These rooms are often booked for friends and couple gatherings, celebratory events, etc. But note, it was for a while at a grey area, since these events are often exceed the cap limit of mass gathering. Behind the success of staycation, I will refer to two key factors. So first, the brand, for brands to think about is what is needed by local consumers. The need to, in this case, it is the need to escape, to meet up in a relatively safe environment. And also the second question is, how can you complement the experience when they are pursuing these needs? So, this, this is the message that I, I, I think for all the brands, how you, domestic, you domesticize your products to allow uh, people to, to cope with the new normal. And next slide, please. So before, even before COVID, we talk a lot about e-commerce, but, but do, amid COVID, when everyone is locked and still at home, E-commerce had taken to the next level, and that is way intrusive. High street retail is very quiet. Before COVID, the industry talked a lot about minimal yet resilient presence, such as pull-up store, but the transition seems to be not enough by today's standard. Not only shopping is going online now, which leads to 126% GMV growth at HKTV Mall in August. We also note that retailers are taking a more proactive approach to reach consumers. Live streaming marketing was first originated in mainland China. In Hong Kong, the idea was first pioneered by skincare and cosmetic sector, which used to be heavily tourist reliant. We see other big platforms such as HKTV Mall, Big Big Shop, which is an online platform owned by TVB, the largest broadcaster in Hong Kong, are modifying their marketing efforts based on this approach. And these sessions are often on live, on uh, retailers' own websites and social media. They are either hosted by Key Opinion Leaders, KOL, or KOC, which is Key Opinion Consumers, TV celebrities, namely One Day Store Manager, or actually run by their own staffs. These sessions often coincide with flash sale, in some cases, especially for smaller retailers, the product itself will no longer be available for purchase after the session. The fast-moving sales model can generate cash flow quickly without needing to keep stock at warehouse, nor permanent staff to look after. 
So uh, I think these are the three key trends that I pick up that uh, have has we see it on the rise during COVID and have a good potential to 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 permanently change the way we spend. And so it leads to the next slide about the implication behind these trends. So first of all, the, the implication of these are that businesses are repurposing their product offer to make it more attractive to locals. You see stronger marketing effort targeting locals and to create unique user experience. This is particularly the case for cosmetic retail and hospitality sector. Take Taiwan and Japan as examples. You see, you may see locals are still traveling across city and regions, but once locked down in Hong Kong, you don't have many places to go, especially service sector is ceased to operate. Hence, stay at home economy is particularly strong here. Consumers are returning to create and maintain the decent livelihood by themselves. Hence, the consumption pattern is turning to be more experience driven. The example I always do is that you will always try new recipes. And when you are in charge of making of your own food, you will want to up your game, leading to good turnover, of premium uh, grocery ingredients, advanced machines. So we're talking about, for example, bread baker, um, uh, sous vide steak, RF skin machine, you name it you will be able to devote more time in the process. It means even a higher price point is now looking justifiable. And now I'm going to talk about like how the future will be looking like in like in the short run, so in a couple months time. The word that we always do is revenge buying. Now I trust everyone can read Chinese. This is a newspaper clipping about immediate sales and the football rebounds following the relaxation of mass gathering restrictions. So premium shopping mall like K11 Museum, where uh, uh, Botnam and Mason uh, is located at, has estimated that Q3's overall sale will grow 60% from Q1. Another shopping mall, D2 Place, which targets on mid-income customers, has distributed a thousand cinema tickets as spending reward. It seems hyper mood for spending is almost inevitable when COVID is over. So the million question before us would be, are the trends we observe just a temporal solution to our current predicament, or it will be somehow reshape the market landscape? With people going back to street and office, usual entertainment option resumed, I say to some degree, the trends we discuss will face a backlash. But generally speaking, the pandemic has already facilitated change that are deemed to come anyway. Expeditious delivery enabled by a better IoT system and online to offline stores network a more informed customers, including tourists who value user experience and a more localized instead of generic and universal offer to consumers. So in conclusion, I know I may not be able to touch on your sector. But I know my present, but I hope my presentation will at least give you an overall idea of the consumer behavior and which direction it is leading to. I'm more than happy to have a chat with you individually, of course, and I trust um, our contacts will be shared after the session. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, we will be now discussing, uh, let's say, should you be interested in setting up e-commerce or direct retail or wholesale activities in Hong Kong, we'll be discussing about setting up a company, tax and accounting requirements, as well as the strategic role that we view for Hong Kong within the specific industry of retail and FMB. I will be presenting alongside with my colleague Francesco Motonati, who is Associate Director of, of Hawksworth. Uh, who, who we are, we are an international corporate services provider. We are headquartered in the UK, in London, and in Jersey. And uh, we have five offices in China. Hong Kong is our largest office in Asia. And then we have an office in Singapore. In terms of sectors, we do assist uh, companies from all sectors, but we have develop specialty practices in tech and innovation, manufacturing and trading, 
consumer retail, luxury, and fashion. We do assist from startups up to multinational and FTSE listed companies. The services we offer range from incorporation of new entities, bank account openings, tax and accounting, immigration, and payroll. Next slide, thank you. So I, I started my career, I'm Dario Conce, I started my career in Hong Kong in 2003, working for an international law firm, and I developed a practice in assisting fashion brands from all over Europe, UK, Italy, and France, in establishing their operations in Hong Kong uh, and uh, developing retail uh, uh, presence in China, joint ventures, distribution agreements, and so on and so forth. Francesco Montonati, as I mentioned, is an associate director. He started in 2013, and he did hold uh, the hand of several brands in the implementation of their on-the-ground activities in Hong Kong, Macau, and China. As I mentioned before, I think that when we discuss about uh, accessing for the industry of retail and FMB, the market of the markets of Asia, Hong Kong, and China, it is useful uh, probably to set the stage by describing a little bit of history. History is definitely always useful to understand the future and to understand the opportunities that you have in uh, Hong Kong, China, and Macau. Uh, I think that we should spend two words about the evolution of retail uh, in Asia by foreign brands. Next slide, thank you. So the evolution of retail in China and Asia started, I would say, in the early 2000s uh, with the modality of franchising. So when I did arrive in Hong Kong, the majority of brands were here operating, not directly, but through partners. So they found it easier uh, to, to venture into these markets and sell uh, through the expertise of third parties franchising companies. These companies took the risk, they opened shops in Hong Kong, Macau, and China, and developed the brand uh, uh, throughout uh, the early, early 2000s. What happened is that during the course of 2005 to up to 2008, the brands realized that the market in China was actually booming, and the profit margins made by the distributors and the franchisees were also interesting. So on one side, they wanted to take back control, learn about the, the markets of Asia, and, uh, and consolidate or start consolidating part of the results. So the trend shifted uh, to joint ventures. So in early, as I said, early 2005 to 2008, there was a flurry of projects of brands that did not want to franchise out 100% activities, but wanted to enter into joint ventures with the distributors. So companies were created in Hong Kong in joint venture with Hong Kong distributors and players to then have direct activities in Hong Kong and China. By year 2010, roughly, the market was so big and all brands realized that the future of their business on the worldwide scale was definitely Asia. And China and Hong Kong being the elephant in the room, being so dramatically important, brands started to want uh, to take back full control of their operation. So in those years, buybacks of joint venture shares or opening of direct operations was, uh, was definitely the, the trend and the strategy of the majority of brands. But China is a huge market. And therefore, what happened is that for brands that now still have to enter into, into the Chinese and Hong Kong markets, they realized that direct was the way, but finding the correct expertise and setting up uh, the human resources with the right know-how to develop efficiently and to bring into profit quickly their activities was very difficult. And therefore, nowadays, direct operation, it is the trend, but through the assistance of the know-how and management service of those that were the franchisees and the distributors in early 2000. So all these companies like the Ferton, the Imaginex, uh, Luxbar from the New World Group, um, and, and, and so on and so forth, that were capable distributors in the past, are now offering their services as managers of the direct activities of brands. The names I've just mentioned of reputable distributors and franchisees 
are actually all names of operators in China that are Hong Kong managed or Hong Kong owned. Therefore, I, in, in our 20 years of experience, we, we can definitely say that Hong Kong has always been the Asian crossroads of the retail industry development. And in a normalized scenario, uh, COVID free, in the, hopefully in the near, near future, Hong Kong represents an approachable solution for exposure to the Chinese consumers. So if you are a small brand and you don't have an investment power to start with a, an, ex, uh, an ambitious plan in China, Hong Kong definitely offers a solution because as Andrew Davis of Invest Hong Kong mentioned before, uh, the trend of pop-ups, uh, single stores that will stay open for six months is, is a very positive and efficient trend. And generally, the cost to set up a presence in Hong Kong and also in Macau is more in absolute terms than setting up in China. Next slide, thank you. Now, from a, a corporate perspective, uh, setting up your activities in Hong Kong is also a very smart way to, to program your access into other markets like China or the, or the ASEAN uh, markets. And the reason is that setting up a company in Hong Kong that will then open a wolf in China or a company in other parts of Asia will offer you a buffer between your headquarters in the UK and more risky jurisdictions like China. It will help you to have a more streamlined process when you need to incorporate your company, for example, in China, because between Hong Kong and China, there are agreements that facilitate the establishment of WUFIs. And of course, you will benefit from the extensive network of double taxation agreements and free trade agreements that Hong Kong has entered into with China, with the UK, and many other countries in Asia. Next slide. Hong Kong is also the perfect jurisdiction. Should you wish or should you find a correct partner to do a joint venture, is the perfect jurisdiction to establish the joint venture. Why? It is a common law jurisdiction. It has an efficient, simple corporate commercial law framework. So dispute resolution is definitely the best jurisdiction, both from ordinary uh, courts uh, route or arbitration. Therefore, the implementation of joint venture agreements and shareholders agreements in Hong Kong offers uh, a broad spectrum of guarantees. Next slide. I would uh, pass uh, to, to the following slides. Uh, Andrew Davis already mentioned Hong Kong will be the center of the Greater Bay Area, which is the biggest uh, initiative, policy initiative from the Chinese government that will put together 11 cities from the Pearl River Delta, uh, highlighting and putting to service of the project all their specific competitive advantages. So Hong Kong from the financial point of view, uh, retail and luxury, uh, Shenzhen, uh, together with Hong Kong on the tech and Guangzhou from the industrial, uh, from the industrial perspective. Just to give you an example. Next slide. Next slide. I will pass now the the, the mic to Francesco, who will get into the details of setting up in in Hong Kong taxation and the initiative, the BUD funding initiative. Francesco, over to you. Thank you, Dario. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, so let's say you, you have in mind to, to expand your business in Hong Kong uh, very well. Uh, what, are the, what, what options do you have in terms of structures uh, for setup? Oh, next slide. Uh, when you want to set foot in Hong Kong, you basically have three main options available. Open a representative office, or register a branch, or set up a limited liability company. Um, I will start from the simplest, which is the rep office. Uh, now, rep office is quite limited in what it can actually uh, formally do, since it, since it can't carry out any revenue generating activities, but is um, only allowed to perform liaising and similar, let's say, quite soft uh, market activities. Uh, from a practical point of view, I would also like to add that it would make it a bit, a bit more complicated for you to open like a bank account or sign contract with local counterparts uh, because of its nature. Uh, by our experience, this is not the uh, say the main the main option uh, on the table for you. Um, for what regards the branch, uh, this can actually carry out uh, business and revenue generating activities. 
but it would take longer to register with local authorities since we are basically registering the foreign companies in Hong Kong. And most importantly, um, it, it does not enjoy uh, limited liability as it is not uh, a separate legal entity from the mother company or head office. So it, let's say it just falls short of a great advantage, which on the other side, the limited company uh, offers you. And the vast majority will opt for setting up a private limited company uh, through which you will be able to carry out any type of activity and enjoy a limited liability. This is by far the, the, the best option available under several aspects. Uh, so uh, I would now like to focus a little bit more on, on the requirements for setup of the private liability company. Um, next slide, please. Um, here you can see what are the main features and requirements of a Hong Kong private limited company. All you need to have is a name. Uh, you don't need to define a business scope. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, with the same limited company, uh, you one day you will be able to provide a uh, design marketing service and the day after you will be able to trade uh, iPhones. Uh, there is no uh, constraint in that sense. Uh, the share capital, there is no minimum requirement here as well. You can set up a company with one Hong Kong dollar. Uh, now the common practice is to set at 10,000, but that's just a common practice again. It's not, it's not a mandatory rule. Uh, you need to have a registered office and typically the company will be domiciled at the, your local service provider. So you do not need an independent standalone physical office to set up, although it will be useful for you for other, other, other things, other purposes that we will see. Uh, both shareholders and directors of the limited liability company uh, can be based overseas, so they do not need to be resident in Hong Kong. This offers great flexibility, especially now that you know, the traveling is so far to be restricted or uh, that, 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 um, complicated. Uh, there, are, there are then some statutory roles that must be covered when setting up a company, and this will be typically offered by uh, professionals like us, local service providers. That will be the company secretary, and the designated representative, as well as the uh, tax representative. Um, next slide. Uh, so on top, uh, Andrew and I have both talked a little bit already about the tax and accounting environment uh, in Hong Kong. And let me just stress, underline one, one, one time more that how clear and very much business friendly it is. Uh, here's a summary of the tax framework. Uh, and I will, and Again, quite simple and straightforward, especially when compared with that of other major economies, of thinking of particularly the European ones. And among the different ones, I would like to focus on the um, double, uh, the double tier, uh, the two tier tax regime and the 825 and 16.5%. This probably still represents the most relevant change in Hong Kong taxation since its introduction in 2018. And in, as I would like to focus on this a little bit more uh, if we switch to the next slide. Um, so until the fiscal year 1718, profit were taxed in Hong Kong at 16.5%. Uh, starting in 1819, the Hong Kong government introduced this two-tier tax regime, which basically allows um, companies to enjoy a 50% tax reduction on the tax rate on their first 2 million Hong Kong dollar profit. Um, as you can, of course, imagine, uh, uh, big multinationals, which normally post hundreds of millions of profits, will not feel much difference, but small, medium enterprises, which are there, mm, say, struggling to decide where to set up or which are already in Hong Kong and have cash flow issues or want to give a boost to their sales, they will, on the other hand, of course, uh, greatly benefit from such, a, from such an update. And the Hong Kong government really wanted to give a boost to SME uh, business and provide a further incentive to overseas company to come and start a business in Hong Kong. This is a unique feature and even other tax-friendly jurisdictions do not offer such a, such a boost. Uh, next slide, all right. Uh, just to give you a swift idea of the benefit of this two-tier tax regime, here's a quick comparison on two different tiers of assessment before and after the introduction of the two-tier tax regime. Um, as you can see, on a profit of, let's say, 3 million Hong Kong dollar, an SME would have paid 465,000, whereas now, thanks to the 8.25 uh, rate, 
uh, we can end up paying only 310,000, and that's a net saving of 155,000 Hong Kong dollars. So really, really a boost the hand to small medium enterprises already established in Hong Kong or looking to establish uh, here. Uh, next slide. Uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so as you can understand, Hong Kong is great for so many reasons, and not only because uh, it has a clear legal uh, environment and a competitive tax regime. There are many other ways in which the local Hong Kong government actually actively um, provides support to companies wishing to establish here and then further expand into the close by market. So think of mainland China as well as other Asian countries. And one of the tools offered by the Hong Kong government is the BUD fund scheme. Uh, next slide. Now, what is the BUD fund scheme? Uh, BUD stands for Branding, Upgrading Operations, and Domestic Sales. Uh, the program was um, firstly launched in 2012 to push Hong Kong as the springboard for companies wishing to jump into other Asian markets, at the beginning primarily male in China, uh, letting them enjoy substantial financial support um, for all those costs related to such expansion into these new markets. Let's say you want to develop the brand, you want to launch a marketing campaign, you want to give a push to your sales in the new market, uh, and so forth. Um, through this funding scheme, you can obtain 50% reimbursement for all those expenses that respect the guidelines, uh, up to a maximum of 4 million reimbursement. So if you have a if you have projects that will cost more or less around 8 million Hong Kong dollars, you can be getting up to 50% reimbursement, so 4 million Hong Kong dollar reimbursement. Uh, who can apply? Uh, all non-listed local companies can apply, provided that they have substantial business operation in Hong Kong. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, basically, you need to have real business in Hong Kong to qualify. Let's say you need to have an office, a real office uh, in place, a shop, local workforce hired, and so forth. Uh, so you don't need to have operations in Hong Kong for multiple years. It's enough that you come, you, you tap into the Hong Kong market, you start your business here, and after a while, you're already thinking of expanding into Hong, uh, Macau, China, Singapore, the Asian countries. This program will, will be suited for you. Uh, you can apply all year long. There are no deadlines. So this is not a COVID-19 related relief measures. Now, of course, it gains so much more relevance because of COVID, but this program has been there uh, since many years, and it's open all year long, so it will not be cut at the end of the pandemic. Um, uh, and every year after year, during its finance budget, Hong Kong has been refinancing and increasing the amount of money you can get under the BUD, the BUD fund scheme. Uh, next slide. Um, here are just other uh, requirements. So for costs to be to qualify and be later reimbursed under this scheme, uh, depending on the amount of each cost item, uh, applicant companies uh, will have to make a procurement exercise uh, just to give you a glimpse of what that means. Uh, let's say that the higher the cost you wish to be reimbursed on the BUD fund, the greater the number of quotation you will have to collect from, let's say, the service provider or suppliers to ensure the fairness of the process. Once this condition is respected, typically the cost will be reimbursed. Uh, and another important point to note, you will have to follow a certain balance among the different costs that you wish to get reimbursement for, uh, according to the nature. Again, to give a practical example, if I if my project is to go and set up uh, set up a, a Wufi in China or a subsidiary in Macau and then open an office and a shop, let's say that the cost for the set now cannot be more than a certain percentage of the total project cost. So you will need to structure your, your, your project uh, with milestones and uh, clearly. And uh, next slide. Uh, here you can see the main sub projects and cost categories that are covered by the BUD fund. Uh, to give you a better grasp of what this means, I would like to give you a practical example of successful BUD fund application, uh, which was completed by a UK client of ours. Uh, so this client has set up its limited company in the summer of 2018, opened its first shop in the newest mall of Hong Kong, the K11 Museum that was mentioned before by one of the speakers. Uh, they hired local employees and started uh, their business. In late 2019, uh, the client developed an interest into trying to enter the mainland China market. Uh, so you, see, you, you, you can actually see uh, pivoting from Hong Kong into other Asian markets. 
Uh, and since the cost for entering uh, China uh, were quite high, it applied for the BUD fund. Uh, now, what cost did they ask reimbursement successfully for under, under the BUD fund? They obtained 50% reimbursement for the setup of their Chinese WeChat account and the subsequent management. They engaged a local KOL to promote the product into mainland China. Uh, they arrange advertising campaigns, uh, both online on Chinese social media as well as offline. Uh, they hired a sales manager in Hong Kong, which would be 100% focus on pushing the Chinese market. Uh, they pay the fee uh, for uh, attending and structuring up their booth at one of the mo most important fashion fairs into China. And then they put in also the smaller costs such as flights, travels, and accommodations cost. Um, so to, uh, to wrap up, to conclude my part, uh, you really see how Hong Kong can offer a unique opportunity for fashion and F&B industry wishing to establish here and later further expand their business into other uh, Asian markets. And to, to link up with our next speaker, Joanna, uh, together with Hong Kong, another key market for fashion retail and F&B is definitely Macau. And any project focused on fashion and F&B should not consider Hong Kong, but Macau as well as part of a, a single overall strategy. And I now give the floor to Joanna to tell us more about Macau. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, a special thanks to Hawksford for putting up such a great webinar. And I would like to personally thank Dario, my good friend, for being able to organize all this. So as um, Francesco was uh, rightly saying, a typically a fashion and retail business uh, operating either in the US or the Europe and who are looking into expanding its business in in China should uh, obviously consider Hong Kong uh, which is still the gem of the greater Bay Area but also Macau to give you a glance and overview on the Macau prospect it has been uh, the COVID-19 free place uh, for the last four months, uh, we have a very musculated and, and business driven um, government who is uh, very fast in, in making decisions. And so we've, we've been able to be COVID-19 free for um, since almost the, the beginning of the pandemic. And that has already shown results in the last uh, golden week holidays, which is the uh, the most prized uh, period of holidays for, for mainland Chinese. We saw visitors returning to Macau in, in a rate that was more satisfying that of Hong Kong. It is the world's uh, largest gaming center by excellence. So fashion and retail who play at the uh, luxury tier are uh, always with their eyes uh, in Macau not only because of the um, window opportunity that it's it's given to mainland Chinese tourists, but also because of the very stimulant uh, low tax rate system and the easy tax filing system that, that we have in Macau. So I'll quickly um, get on with the, the legal requirements of setting up in Macau. Uh, looking into uh, the slides, I will mention the two key uh, players for setting up operations in Macau or, or a company in Macau, which are the sole propriety, which is obviously, as the name says, it's comprised of one shareholder, or by quotas. Um, none uh, of these uh, these uh, types of companies require the shareholder to be a, a local or a Chinese national, so it's, it's an absolutely uh, no restriction environment in Macau as well. Many of the things I'm going to mention here will be uh, similar in Hong Kong. So for our audience, if uh, you have experience with Hong Kong, you, you will feel quite familiar with the requirements here um, in Macau. The offshore business type of companies have been seized as of uh, 2019. Um, and they are, uh, the existing ones will have to uh, deregister by the end of uh, this year. Next slide, please. 
So for the registration process, we do require a minimum registered capital of 25,000 patakas. Uh, patakas is the local currency in Macau. And uh, for those who are less familiar, the Hong Kong dollar and the, the pataka are more, more or less par in par on, 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 on a one-to-one -one currency exchange. So if we uh, are to refer to patakas, we will say that they are the equivalent to Hong Kong dollars. Although we do have this registered capital uh, minimum, uh, the registry office will not request for a proof of funds deposit. So it's, it's, it's until now a virtual 25,000 uh, requirement. You will have to appoint one director at least or more if you want to function as a board of direction, directors. Again, there are no restrictions to the appointment of directors. They can be either local or non-locals. Um, a remark here as uh, directors who are strictly foreigners without a working visa in Macau, although they will be allowed entry in Macau as per their tourist visa requirements, um, they will not be allowed to work in Macau as per se. So we have to be a bit careful with how um, close the director will, will wish to, to work in Macau as to consider eventually a working visa for a foreign director. The appointment of a company secretary uh, is not a mandatory requirement, um, but it is advisable due to compliance issues of bookkeeping, um, minutes resolutions and authority to sign uh, for and on behalf of the company in, in physical acts. Next slide, please. To set up a company, you will have to get a pre-approved company name check certificate. This is a pro forma um, certificate that is issued by the registry office. Uh, the company name may bear an English name as long as a Chinese and a Portuguese name are also registered. The articles of association, they can be very general as our system is, is, a, is a civil law system. And so most of uh, the default rules are already codified in the commercial code. Uh, but again, it's always good practice to replicate uh, at least the essential rules and add on some depending on how the client wishes to govern the company. They will have to be drafted in at least Portuguese or Chinese. We here at the office normally do it bilingual for the convenience of the client. I think it's always good to have in hand a document that you fully understand, and this is possible to do so in Macau. Typically, a registration process will be done in approximately 10 to 15 business days, depending on the workload of the registry office. And with the completion, a business registration certificate is issued. Next slide, please. Um, in setting up operations in Macau, what can we expect? Basically, what will be the hurdles that you may encounter? Finding an office. Um, as you may know, Macau is not as big as Hong Kong. And so we do lack in office spaces. And this comes uh, with obviously a volatile uh, rental, uh, rental environment. The costs are quite high in that department, not as high as in Hong Kong, but we are getting there. Um, so many of our clients, at least on the first phase, will wish to have their registered address with the service provider. So basically a virtual office scheme and then move on to a physical when they are um, more muscled up in terms of, uh, of funds. A physical office uh, will help in the process of opening up a bank account. The bank accounts, uh, bank accounts uh, available in Macau are actually multi-currency, so you can either choose to have a Pataka or a Hong Kong dollar account, as well as a Euro, a US dollar, Japanese yen, and RMB. Uh, we have a robust, a robust uh, financial uh, environment, and most of our banks here have international uh, representation. Uh, 
compliance is obviously getting stricter. It's uh, it's been a worldwide experience. Um, from what the, the feedback I've I've been getting from clients is still less strict than uh, Hong Kong. Um, although obviously normal inquiries on the prospect of operations and how the business will be run uh, will be expected and the client needs to be prepared to answer these questions for compliance issues. The most challenging part perhaps will be local manpower and hiring foreign manpower. Um, we have uh, satisfactorily a very low unemployment rate, uh, it's less than 1%, which means that obviously um, there isn't sufficient manpower to fulfill uh, the fast-growing business that we are seeing in Macau. However, hiring far foreign manpower is becoming more and more of a troublesome process. Just very recently, uh, as of uh, 5th of October, it's been put in place a, a another regulation that requires uh, hiring foreign nationals to be mandatorily done through a unemployment agency. And that obviously means fees for the employer, also for the employee, and a, a, an unexpected, uh, eventually uh, an unexpected surprise in terms of the employee who is being recruited from abroad uh, upon entry. There are some uh, restrictions in place for uh, due to COVID-19. As of uh, January this year, no foreign nationals are being allowed entry in Macau and we have started in September to allow entry to mainland Chinese only uh, with a wave of uh, quarantine if they come from no risk or, or less risky areas of China. This is uh, a very, very simple glance into Macau's prospect. The idea here was to tease a little bit your mind about uh, this Macau Hong Kong articulation. So I'll leave the floor for more questions. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, we did receive a couple of questions uh, from our audience. Um, the first one is, uh, what is the industry uh, that has seen the largest growth with UK companies coming to Hong Kong in the past year or so? Um, if any one of the speakers would like to pick this up. Um, maybe I can speak from a DIT perspective. Um, so first of all, I, we see, of course, a very strong uh, growth on uh, food and drink sector, particularly for those uh, uh, FMCGs as well. So, so thinking of, for example, frozen food, uh, we have an example of a UK frozen food brand. Uh, we uh, recently launched on HKTV Mall and then all the stock was clear within 72 hours. So um, we have lots of these examples and one of the key gist of it is that the, end, the entry strategy must have kind of a digital angle on it in order to allow a consumer to, to easily assess them. Also, I mean, from Invest Hong Kong perspective, I mean, the two very strong sectors in the last few years have been um, creative industries as well as business and professional services but close on those are the consumer products so retail as well as food trading um, and uh, hospitality based industries so it's it's fairly broad from the UK um, financial services is another one that's been very strong as well as fintech All right, uh, and the second one we received, let's say it's more on our topic, is uh, which are the countries and economies covered under the BUD fund? So uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll reply to this one. Uh, so definitely made in China. This was the original uh, the target economy when the fund was launched in 2012. And then Hong Kong decided basically to, to, to expand, as, as we like to say, Hong Kong is Asia world city. So they enlarged the, the funding scheme to all the countries which are part of ASEAN, so the association of uh, 
uh, Southeast Asian uh, nations, as well as those countries with which Hong Kong has a free trade agreement. So Macau, definitely. So you open up your company in Macau, start the business here, and then you're in retail or luxury, you expand into that jurisdiction as well. And other major economies with which uh, Hong Kong has free trade agreements, I can think of as uh, Chile and Australia, which are not part of Asian countries. Uh, so you can see, apart from uh, Japan and South Korea, basically you have all the economies uh, open up for you uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, region. I don't think we receive others. Uh, any other questions from our audience? Please feel free to drop them. All right. Then. I'll leave to Dario for uh, final remarks. Uh, thanks, everybody, again. Thank you. I would just add that, uh, given that we have uh, we have been and we are very close to to many F and D and fashion luxury brands, just to give you an idea of the relevance of Hong Kong and Macau pre-crisis, brands such as uh, Dolce and Gabbana or Versace uh, had their highest revenue making all over the world in Macau. And in Hong Kong, in Canton Road. So we 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 trust and 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 believe that once this period of crisis is is over, uh, opportunities will come back quite quickly in in Hong Kong and Macau. Well, thank you very much to all the attendees um, for for attending the event. But most of all, thank you for the great support that the institutions like the EIT, Arthur Corin, and Andrew Davis from Invest Hong Kong did give us. Uh, if you have any question or you need support, please reach out to them. Uh, and uh, and if you need uh, assistance, uh, reach us out here in Hong Kong and Macau. Thank you again, and, uh, and see you at the next event. Thank you very much, Dario. Thank you very much, Dario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.